We, we all hope. We all hope. The one gift that was left in Pandora's box when it was sprung open and all the terrible and wonderful gifts were released into the world, the one thing that we get to keep is hope. There, there's an online list of, of hopes where you can kind of track and post your hope, and there are thousands of records of things that people are hoping for. Some entries are funny, some are scary, some are heartrending. I wish I could be rich immediately. Of course. I wish to be fantastically happy forever with everything going fantastically well. Of course. Then it turns a little more dark. I wish he would just die. I hoped that it wasn't cancer. We, we just can't seem to help ourselves, do we? When somebody's very ill, we talk about the will to live. What, what is the will to live? It's hope. We seem to hope kind of in two ways. We, we hope for something and we hope in someone. But here's the terrible truth that all the things that we place our trust in, all the things we hope for, will, will eventually disappoint us, won't they? Every circumstance, every situation we hope for is going to wear out or it's going to give out or fall apart or melt away or go away. And on that day, we begin to question the foundation of our hopes, don't we? We're faced with lesser hope. Our gospel story today is, as I mentioned, a follow-up to the walk to Emmaus, the disciples on that first Easter left Jerusalem, at least two of them did, and walked on their way to a town called Emmaus. In, in the body of that scripture is, I think, one of the saddest lines in all of scripture. The story takes place that first Easter. The disciples are now in hiding. Their hopes are dashed because their Messiah, their master, their friend, was brutally killed. But now there's strange news from a tomb, far-fetched ideas from the women about an empty tomb. And now two of the disciples have returned from Emmaus, breathlessly telling that how Jesus had come among them and was revealed in the breaking of the bread. Those disciples had met Jesus on the road. They didn't know who it was, but as they walked and talked, they talked about the things that had been going on in these last few days. And it's in the middle of retelling that story that the saddest line in Scripture comes. It's just really three words. We had hoped. We had hoped that he was going to be the Messiah. We had hoped. Now, if you've ever had hopes dashed, you know how profoundly sad that statement is. We had hoped for healing. We had hoped for success. We had hoped for reconciliation. We know how sad the outcome of those statements are. So when we enter into a time of Scripture, we look at these disciples who are basically fleeing from Jerusalem, hopes squashed, moving in a new direction to a new place. And they relate to this stranger about dashed hopes. In other words, hopes can break your heart. And these guys have been through a big, horrible disappointment in what's happened to Jesus. How do we handle hope? We all have to handle it in our lives. Hope can break your heart. It's a quote. It's a line. It's one of the memorable lines from the movie The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody seen it? You can redeem the gospel for yourself if you want to watch that story again. It has two central characters in it. It takes place within, within Shawshank, Shawshank Prison. The two characters are played by Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman, and they have a running argument, basically, throughout the entire movie about hope. Freeman learned to manage his hope by giving up on hope. Hope is a dangerous thing, he says. Hope can break your heart. To Tim Robbins, though, another person in prison there, to quit hoping is to, stop, uh, is to start dying. So We see this juxtaposition between these two people. Tim Robbins' character throughout the, the remainder of the movie is building a sense of hope in the prison and the prisoners of Shawshank 
and in the character played by Morgan Freeman, his name was Red. And with the final line of the movie, now Morgan Freeman, some 40 years into his sentence, is finally paroled, and he heads off to the blue waters of the Pacific Ocean in Mexico, hoping for a reunion with his great friend. And if you remember the scene, the last few minutes is simply a litany of all the things that Red, the voice of Morgan Freeman, is saying he's hoping for. I hope to see my friend again. I hope the Pacific is as blue as they say it is. And in the end, as he's walking up to the boat where his friend is working and they see one another, the movie ends with two profound words. I hope. How do you handle your hope in a world that looks awfully like Good Friday or the Saturday before Easter? You're like, Red, is hope a dangerous thing? I can see that. Hope can break your heart. I've known that. But hope can also open your life. I, I think Luke particularly gives us so much evidence about <laughs> the resurrected Christ in their story today, that he's attempting to rebuild the hope of the followers who are now shattered in their hope. He shows them his hands and his feet. They touch him. Jesus addresses their worries that he's not a hallucination, that he's not a phantom. He eats a piece of fish in front of them, kind of like bullet points in a presentation. Over and over we see... Luke presenting evidence for the reality of Jesus. And then he sits down and opens their mind in the Bible study. I've said this before. There's a Bible study I'd like to be a part of, the one that Jesus leads. They need to have their hope restored from the shattering realities of that Good Friday and that terrible day of silence between and the bewildering events of early Easter. Hope is... A dangerous thing, isn't it? It can break your heart. Hope can open your life. We carry within us, I think that's why we, we carry within us in Christians sort of a, a big hope that when all the things that we'd hoped for come tumbling down, there is someone you can put your hope in that will open your life again. Jesus, in our gospel today, a snippet of a story, really, not the whole story, is opening up their lives. He's restoring their hope. He's renewing their purpose. And how does he do it? Notice the emotions in our story. It's always important to watch the emotions in a, in a gospel reading. In the reading, now it's Easter. You'd think it would be like party time, that they would be having you know, the barbecue by now, but that's not the case for the disciples. They're still huddled in fear. They have doubt and fear. In their joy, they're disbelieving. I love the honesty of that Easter faith. How many of us as believers have a joy in yet disbelieving faith? Not quite sure what to believe, but we want to be around it. We want to be among the saints because we know somehow it tethers us to an important story but Jesus steps into their midst. And it says that in his presence there is peace. He always seems to wish that upon them. It's the first thing he gives them. How, how does that peace happen? How does that, how does that hope get restored? How is purpose renewed? First, he gives them evidence that he's not haunting them. I never thought about it really quite like that, that maybe they thought that he was haunting them. But he's actually with them. Now, this is no spiritual resurrection Luke wants us to see that this is not just, you know, he's still with us. But he really is actually with us, physically alive. Consider the importance that, that such a thing places upon the material. You know, religions have sort of a debate about the spiritual and the material. Christians can get into this too, can't we? Well, the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. I'm not sure we can make that clear of a delineation when we have a Savior who is raised physically and that there's something important about physicality in the resurrection. I mean, he could have just shown up as a specter and we'd have all been like, yes, but that's not what he showed up as. He showed up as himself. It means that matter matters. It means that we can't just jettison 
the idea of this world. That somehow we're not of this world means that we would therefore ignore this world. Because physicality matters to Jesus. It puts a new importance on all the matter that's around us. Our lives and the lives of everyone and everything matter to God. They're unique. They're eternal from the most significant of beings to the simplest of beings. The goal of other theories like reincarnation, you know, it's the cycle of being reborn, and there's no guarantee it's going to go better, you know. How is, why is it that whenever I hear about people talk about past life, it was never like terrible. Uh, I remember being a worm. They were always like the Prince of Siam or something. It, what kind of narcissism is this? You know, but reincarnation is just a cycle of rebirth until you get it right, until you get good enough. And then the goal of it is to be released from life. I, I find that astounding, astonishing, and, and so lacking of hope for all that God has made, for all of creation, from you and your own physicality to the newts in the, in the Malibu Creek to the rocks and boulders, to the world that God created out of love. Resurrection means that those things are infused with new purpose and new meaning and new importance. And you and I are restored in a way to be the steward of those things as we were from the very beginning. Second, notice that his body, this body, still bears the marks of his suffering. They weren't magically erased in resurrected life. Those of you who are hoping for a resurrected body without wrinkles, <laughs> not the best news, is it? <laughs> Even Jesus' resurrected body bears witness to the way of being for others. Think about that. He doesn't lose the identifying marks of how he lived to serve others. He embodies love even in this. He embodies love even after death. As Fred Craddock, a preaching professor who recently died, by the way, observes, the identification between Jesus and the eternal Christ is critical, not just for theology, but also for defining the nature of the Christian life. If the Jesus who died belongs to the historical past, but the one disciples follow now is the eternal Christ, then the Christian life can take on forms of spirituality that are without suffering for others that are without the way of the cross, without any engagement in the issues of life in this world, all the while expressing a devotion for the living spiritual Christ. But because he bears the scars of a life for others, indicates the kind of lives that we are to have as well. Not lives of just Jesus and me and to hell with the world, literally. But it's Jesus and me and the rest of the world for the rest of our lives. His pierced body bears witness against a mode of discipleship that does not endure scars on behalf of other people. We are to be engaged. Third, and I love this line, he opens their minds to the scripture. I, I could just spend hours thinking about what that means. Jesus interprets the whole of the Torah, the Hebrew scriptures, in light of himself, reminding them that he's done it before. Remember, I taught you before. And now he teaches them again that it was necessary for suffering and death and resurrection. I find what's fascinating about biblical literacy today, well, it's alarming. I don't find it fascinating. So much of, of our literature, so much of our history and tradition, so much of our language is, is based off of biblical knowledge. You cannot win at Jeopardy without biblical knowledge. And yet, biblical knowledge is becoming a thing of the past, isn't it? People don't know it. Ask your children some basic questions about phraseology, where those things come from, about the meaning of things, about why the third day is so important. Would they know what it meant? I mean, where would, where would Lincoln or Martin Luther King be without the biblical narrative informing their words and their vision for society? And that's where we're going. How many of us are versed in Scripture in a way in which it is helpful for us in rehearsing our hope? It is a practice of our everyday lives in which we ground ourselves 
in a hope that can't be swept away when physicality goes wrong or the love of our life turns out to not be the love of our life or illness disappoints and hopes remain shattered. God continues to speak through the Word and the Word continues to reveal the truth about Christ and the, rest- and the, and the Word itself restores our hope. It becomes a foundation but many have stopped rehearsing their hope. And what will be the fruit of that? Finally, Jesus restores their hope by pushing them back into life with a mission. Christ followers are to do this. Proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins and to serve as witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of the crucified. Inasmuch as we participate in the, in the revelation of God and in God getting known in the world, we are like those first disciples in Luke's gospel. We also were witnesses to the God who's done so much for us in Christ. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be complicated. And it doesn't have to be judgmental. We are to tell the story of Jesus which leads to a change of mind. It's not your work to change people's minds. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It is our work to be witnesses to what God has done in Christ for us and to proclaim that in Him, we and the whole world can find a way back to God and that way is called forgiveness. Hope. It's the center of the Easter story. Hope is the center of what holds us together. Hope is the center of the whole Christian message. Death couldn't hold Jesus, and death, therefore, cannot hold us forever. Jesus' presence with us today continues to sustain and empower, challenge, and comfort the followers of Jesus. Easter hope isn't the easy option. I know oftentimes we get criticized for saying, by and by, you know, how's that phrase go? In the sky, by and by, whatever. You know, sort of the escapist fantasy of what religion is supposed to be about. But we continue to go into life where we're to be scarred and where we are going to suffer for following Jesus and in our service to other people. So we must seek God's word of guidance and courage and correction. Easter doesn't make the mission any less dangerous. It just makes it more important. Easter hope Red was right. It's a dangerous thing because it asks for a life to be changed. That's repentance. And it offers a word of forgiveness. And if anything is risky, it's forgiveness. And you know it. There are few things which provoke us than being asked to forgive those who've wronged us and represent good news to the world when we aren't quite so sure that the whole world deserves good news. So hope is a dangerous thing. It can break your heart. That's true. But hope can also open your life. The meaning of our lives as children of God, and again, you need to learn that litany too. Who are you? I'm a child of God. It's to be a witness and a representative of this hope in the world. Now, I I don't know about you, but as I look at the world and I read the news and I see what's going on, as I see people wanting to give up on the sinful and broken world, that's the wrong direction. That's not where the Christian gospel calls us. It calls us into the very heart of a broken world, into the very midst of a sinful creation with a proclamation that there is hope and that there's a way back and the way is called a change of mind, a change of direction. For God is always willing to forgive. The world, your neighbors, maybe you need that new hope. Be a witness of the ones who are as good as dead, that there is good news for those because we follow a God who was as good as dead, whose hope had been destroyed, but now he lives. Leo Tolstoy once wrote, The business of a Christian, by the means of which he attains all his purposes, is everywhere and always one, to increase one's fire and let it give light to others. 
how are you handling your hope? Amen.